This week, we're talking about the second season of Star Wars Resistance. Plus, I sit down with the Russo brothers to talk about Star Wars and Star Wars related things. Do your thing, Yoda Fountain. This is the Star Wars Show. From the Lucasfilm headquarters in San Francisco, here's your hosts, Andy and Anthony. Uh-uh, it's oh, me this week. it's you this week, yeah. go! Hello and welcome to the Star Wars Show, the only Star Wars show on the internet that for one week only takes the Star Wars you love and tosses a little bit of MCU in the middle. Think of it like a synergy sandwich. A corporate croissant. A business burrito. A Disney Dagwood. Man, I miss when AJ was writing the show. Me too. Hopefully the news will be better than the opening. Star Wars Resistance just released a trailer for its second and final season this morning. The story for season two finds the residents of the Colossus lost in space being pursued by Agent Tierney and Commander Pyre, all while Kaz and crew face a myriad of new dangers like bounty hunters, General Hux, and Kylo Ren. The second season of the Emmy-nominated series will begin on Sunday, October 6th at 10 p.m. on the Disney Channel and Disney Now. For more details about the second season as well as the full season two trailer, check out StarWars.com SWS. And speaking of StarWars.com, they've just unveiled an excerpt from the new book, Black Inspired by Delilah Dawson. The excerpt follows Vi Marathi as she receives a new mission from General Leia Organa to establish a base for the resistance at Black Spire Outpost on the mysterious planet of Batuu. They have good snacks there. <laughs> also revealed was a new map of Batuu that will be included in the book exclusively at Barnes & Noble. You can read the full excerpt and look at the map on StarWars.com SWS right now. Or if you don't want it spoiled, you can read Black Spire yourself when it hits store shelves on August 27th. And because we're talking about Black Spire and Batuu, let's take a look at how the artists and Imagineers at Lucasfilm and Walt Disney Imagineering came up with the look and feel of Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. That was a very clean segue, family. Thank you. One of our truths that we have built this whole project on is the idea of authenticity. When you walk into Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, you need to feel like you have walked into Black Spire Outpost that has been there for a thousand years. It has to feel that weight of history. It has to feel that weight of layers of story. We wanted to kind of understand all of the, the locations from Coruscant to Geonosis to Tatooine, but it wanted to be unique. So in order to establish that framework, we went back to the origins of Star Wars. That ended up being Ralph McQuarrie, Joe Johnston, and look at their aesthetic. We started giving this place descriptions, right? Like, well, we want it to be mysterious. We want it to be romantic. We want it to be colorful. And as we started to look around the world and we started talking about places that were like that, we quickly started to center around places like the Middle East. We went on location, we went to Marrakesh, we went to Istanbul to find, you know, well, what is it about these locations that make it feel real? What is it that really informs the viewer that there's layers and layers of history? And it's really important because it sort of grounds the design in a layer of reality that you would not have otherwise. We looked a lot to ancient civilizations in terms of how things were built with primitive materials, with stone and mud and brick. And we won't necessarily replicate those things, but it just gives us a good sense of inspiration of the logistics of building. One of the biggest challenges we have is because it's such a large site and there's so many different intricate details, is making sure all those details work together. We're trying to push the materials really to the limit. We're using different techniques just to really make sure that the surface, the texture and the color looks aged and the way to achieve that we just layer things on top of each other. We really do a thorough job to make sure that what we deliver to the guests are as believable and as correct as possible. We can't think of music as an independent element like they do in a feature film. We are creating a three-dimensional soundscape that people will walk through and we did that with smaller ensembles and a variety of different artists and a variety of different compositional styles that felt true and native to the place. It had to feel organic to the design and the look of the world. The compositional possibilities are endless. There's so much more that you can experience on a sculptural level where you're literally visiting a new place. And so that kind of intensity envelops you after a while where literally you'll get into a zone where you're just exploring and exploring. Absolutely thrilled to have with me in the studio today, Joe and Anthony Russo, welcome. Avengers Endgame, the literal biggest movie in human history. What is that like to walk around with? <laughs> That's gotta know. be wild. You it's hard to you, process you it. You can't really carry that around. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's too much, right? At the end of the day, we're happy the movie was well received and we're proud of the film. People were excited yeah. and that's the reward for us. We know Peter Parker has watched Star Wars and he's hanging out with Mace Windu and Lando Calrissian, <laughs> Dryden Bot. How does this work? They just look like those characters. They, yes, yeah, the they Nick Fury actually, happens to look a lot yeah. like Is it tough to be Mace a spy Windu. when you look like an Oscar award winner? <laughs> 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 
I, I would assume. <laughs> that's how good Nick Fury is. That's yes. how good, yeah. yeah. Were you all big Star Wars fans growing up? Huge. I mean, Enormous, I think probably yeah, the yeah. singular greatest influence on us is Empire Strikes Back, and we've been pretty vocal about that. Do you want to look directly into camera and just say that again? Empire <laughs> so we have Strikes that. <laughs> Back. We've told the story that, you know, went to the theater and sat there from first screening to the last screening, probably watched it four or five times in a row, and just couldn't leave the theater. It was just so emotionally impactful for us. I think it's and the... challenging yeah. for a kid, too. You know, the tension and darkness in that story really grabs you in a way. And we've always liked things that don't speak to you as a kid, but have a little bit more of elevated sensibilities in terms of your emotional sort of... Treat you like an all. adult, yeah, you know? Exactly. That's what we loved about the movie and respected. Growing up, together star wars was played at home who got to be who who lost the argument to be the character that they wanted to be <laughs> I, i'm trying to think I mean, <laughs> sorry, you know, you know han solo was the biggest influence on me as, as far as a role model mine was boba fett yeah. so we didn't there was no competition there so you were a han solo guy you were a boba fett guy were there any other characters that really spoke to you when you were growing up you know i think luke skywalker the most quintessential hero and the most identifiable hero and certainly darth vader we love complicated villains and complicated relationships between protagonists and antagonists and it's good as it gets with Darth Vader. Yeah, it's definitely something that you see a lot in your characters. You've got Thanos who is like literal family of your heroes and so you definitely kind of see those parallels there. In Winter Soldier too, I mean, look, we sat down with Marvel the first time we met with them about it and talked about the relationship between Cap and Bucky and we said, it's a Star Wars relationship. You have a villain that is related to the hero, although they're not actual relationships. Actual relations. Like they grew yeah. up together. They're like brothers. That creates the richest, most profound kind of storytelling when you have that close of a relationship between a hero and villain. One of the things that I particularly love about the movies that you've been making with the MCU is it seems like you don't really look at superhero as a genre. What films did you love? What kind of stuff do you like to bring into the MCU? I mean, we had a really interesting upbringing. We were pop culture junkies, but then in our teen years, we became really obsessed with foreign film and the French New Wave and the Italian neorealists. So we had a very complicated background and I think that hodgepodge of influence is reflected in our work that we've done for Marvel. We don't perceive genre as sort of a singular experience that tends for us to be a boring interpretation of it. We try to look for ways to subvert the genre to create something different or some new and unique element and that's what excites us about making these films. One of the things that sort of Star Wars and the MCU have in common is there's constantly multiple projects being worked on, multiple directors, different types of media going on. I mean this is a a huge universe to keep running smoothly, right? A big part of the picture is the interconnectivity. However, you can't get lost in that. So there's a real structure in place to allow each movie to sort of become what it wants to become, have its own space. We're sort of aware of everything that's happening, but everybody's really respectful in the sense of you don't want to cramp what anybody else is trying to do. You find that sort of minimum connection point. Well, Joe, Anthony, thank you so much for coming by. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. It's a pleasure. It's awesome to be here. This is, by the way, the incredible collection. You can't see it yeah <laughs> but out in this office here it is a collection to rival Kevin Feige's collection. We're, we're very Star proud. Wow. I like hearing that. Ask him about his party barge. How, how uh, big I it is. I definitely will. He ended oh, yeah. up buying like the, the, the half Hasbro of them one. just yeah. so they would make it. <laughs> so he could have one of them. Inside. Oh my God. Yeah. Really? He's got he's got oh, like yeah. 20 of them sitting in the. Oh yeah. Somewhere. Just so it could happen. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. You're watching the Star Wars show. Man, there were so many important questions I wanted to ask the Russo brothers, and I just didn't have the time. Yeah, super important ones, right? I'm yeah. sure. Like, uh, th well, a lot of them are continuations of my Spider-Man theories. Uh -huh. Like, so, Ben Mendelsohn is Talos, and Talos is a shapeshifter, so does that mean director Krennic is a Skrull? Hmm. These are the important questions, yeah. and I can't believe they wrapped me before I got to ask that. Cool, uh, that's really rough for you. Sorry, uh, well, last week we asked you what your favorite unknown cameos in Star Wars were, and boy, did you have a lot of them. Useless R5 <laughs> unit was a fan of the R2KT cameo in The Force Awakens, and Tyler was amped to see the 501st logo hidden at Maz's castle. William is a fan of all the hidden Indiana Jones Easter eggs in The Clone Wars and Solo, and Black Diamond LT1 loved the Ralph McQuarrie cameo in The Empire Strikes Back. But clearly, the best unknown cameo is Senator Grebleeps from The Phantom Menace. Nothing but respect for my senator. Thank you to everybody who responded and thank you for watching this week. As always, remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks for watching and may the force be with you. These are the things that keep me up at night. If Stan Lee was reading the script for Mallrats on the bus, that means he's Stan Lee, the guy who made all those Marvel comics. Bro, he's a watcher.